For those of you who joined us over the last couple of minutes, welcome to the April 2021 meeting of the Naples chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. My name is Andy Nacarado. I am the chapter president and programs chair and the Zoom host for this evening. I'm also joined by a few more of our board members. We have um, Evan Barr with us this evening. Becky Troop, Wade Gurley, and Karen Allman is just on her way in. So thank you everybody for joining us. All right, so I'll just have a few brief announcements before we get to our feature presentation for this evening. And that is going to be about Cypress Cove land keepers preserving old Florida and one man's legacy presented by Shane Duff. And we're really excited to have Shane and many other uh, members of the Cypress Cove Land Keepers with us this evening. So welcome everybody. We already touched on the Zoom housekeeping and it looks like everybody is ready to go. Um, so if you do have a question at any time during the feature presentation, um, go ahead and put your type your question into the chat. And after Shane's talk is over, I'll read those questions to him. So they'll be addressed after the presentation. Or if you don't have access to the chat, you'll be in invited to unmute yourself to ask a question at the end. All right, I am so excited about this first announcement because the Naples chapter recently has exceeded 100 members in our chapter. I think we're somewhere around 104 members at this point. And for all of us currently on the board of directors, uh, we aren't aware of a time that the chapter was above 100 members. So for me, that's going back to 2013. So we're really exciting that we're um, gaining all these new friends and members and just major thank you to everybody who's become a member this year and anybody who's been renewing for many years. We couldn't do what we do without you. And we really thank you for your dedication to native plant awareness, education and conservation in Collier County. We are very, very excited about this. Thank you. And if you are feeling you know, celebratory about this. We have a great event to tell you about that's coming up later this month. This is going to be uh, Celebrate the Earth put on by Collier County Parks and Recreation, honoring Earth Day on Saturday, April 24th from nine to noon. And this will be at three different parks, North Collier Regional Park, Sugden Regional Park and Connor Park. And if you are with us for our social time earlier this evening, this is the event that we were talking about a little bit for Earth Day. So at each of these parks, Collier County Garden volunteers will be offering family-friendly activities such as playing nature bingo, viewing caterpillars up close, or planting flowers for butterflies. And at each of these parks, the event is going to be centered around the butterfly garden areas. And in this photo here, this is the butterfly garden at Sugden Regional Park. Uh, but a, a representative of the Naples chapter will be available at each of the parks to help with native plant identification, to discuss the benefits of native landscaping, and also to show off some example container gardens that are beneficial for our native pollinators. I would like to give a shout, shout out to the event organizer, Connie Nagel. She is also the membership chair for the Naples chapter. And um, the only reason why she is not sharing all this information with you is that it is also her birthday today, along with a, another member in the audience tonight. So we wish happy birthday to Connie and Linda and everyone who has a birthday today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you if you come out to celebrate the earth on April 24th. 
If you want to learn more about the different parks, their locations, their amenities, more details can be found on callyourparks.com. And then I just have an, another few upcoming events to share with you. This Saturday, April 10th, we will have a small group of Naples chapter members going to visit the Gore Nature Education Center and Preserve. So that is the focus of tonight's presentation by Shane Duff. So even if you're not able to come out this weekend to get a preview of the center and the preserve, um, Shane will be sharing some information with you tonight so you can learn about how you can visit in the near future. Then on Saturday, May 1st, is going to be the next date that the Naples chapter is facilitating native plant sales at Cutting Horse Eco Center in Bonita Springs. So this was like uh, back on March 20th, our chapter facilitated plant sales on that date. So we'll be back again on May 1st. If you read the newsletter very closely, you might have seen that it said May 15th. We have changed the date, moved it up to May 1st. But every Tuesday and Saturday, you can visit Cutting Horse Eco Center to purchase native plants and see their demonstration gardens. It's just the next date that the Naples chapter is going to be there selling the plants is going to be May 1st. Our next chapter meeting is going to be Wednesday, May 5th at 630 or join at six o'clock for the optional social time, just like tonight. And the topic for next month's meeting is going to be native plants and eco philosophy. Very interesting. And that will be presented by Eric Fote, who is the natural areas director at Naples Botanical Garden. Then finally, uh, wrapping up the end of May on the 29th, again, the Naples chapter will be back at Cutting Horse Eco Center for another native plant sale. So make sure to Mark some of these dates in your calendar. If you are not yet a member or you're not getting our newsletter yet, I encourage you to visit our chapter website at fnpsnaples.org. And in the top right corner, the blue button, you can click to join the Naples chapter starting at just $35 per year. Or if you are looking to start receiving our newsletter, there's a link down towards the bottom right corner um, where you can start receiving our newsletter. All right, without further ado, those are the end of the announcements. So thank you everybody for your attention. But now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. And I'm just going to minimize this slide for a moment so that I can read, okay. So I can read Shane's introduction. Okay. Shane Duff is the president of Cypress Cove Landkeepers, the founding organization behind Naples' new Gore Nature Education Center, named for local conservationist, Dr. Robert H. Gore III. In addition to supervising site planning and the Gore homestead renovation, Shane also oversees the 10 Acre Properties Wildlife Monitoring Program. Shane is honored to help Cypress Cove landkeepers carry on Dr. Gore's commitment to conserve and protect the land and wildlife that call it home while educating the younger generation about environmental stewardship. Since relocating to Southwest Florida three years ago, Shane has immersed himself in the wonder of this unique ecosystem by exploring, advocating, and actively volunteering. We're very excited to have you here tonight as our speaker, Shane. And now you should be able to share your slides with us. Excellent. Thanks, Andy. Um, happy to be here. Appreciate the invite. Let me get uh, my screen share going here. Maybe. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. 
So we'll share, like I said, a little bit of who we are, uh, what we're doing here at, not just at the Gore Nature Education Center, but as a whole, the long-term vision and plans for the organization and where we're, like I said, where we're going from here. And also share a little bit about how you can get involved. Obviously, everyone on this call is passionate uh, about a lot of the similar things that, that got us excited about these ecosystems. Many of you from outside of this area originally. So it's always nice to have like-minded people involved in the organization and involved with the property. It is a pretty interesting place and definitely unique to this part of Florida or to any part of Florida for that matter, which we'll, we'll share a little bit about. And we'll take some time for Q&A. Andy mentioned that there is a uh, group, maybe some of you on the call tonight that are gonna be coming out this coming weekend for a field trip. We will be opening hopefully to the public in short order. Uh, we've been saying that for quite some time, but in the meantime, we do wanna offer, especially those of you on this call and any members of the Native Plant Society here at Naples chapter, the opportunity to come out and enjoy a private tour. And we can bring you through and show you a little bit about more of what we're doing. So one of the big reasons that I was attracted to this, and I think many people that have gotten involved as well were attracted to this was, I think ultimately in this world today, we are seeing a bit of a gap in children's connection with nature. I think in general, society's connection with nature, but it's always a lot easier to try to create habits and behaviors at an early age. So this is a, you know, a quote from Thomas Berry, teaching children about the natural world should be treated as one of the most important events in their lives. And I don't know about many people on this call, but I think we probably all could say that we grew up outdoors. Uh, we grew up playing in the dirt a lot more than playing on a phone or watching TV. And Thomas Berry was a, was a big thinker and very focused on looking at the, the social challenges and ecological challenges and how those related to people's connection or lack thereof with nature. There's been tons of studies, uh, not surprising to anyone or news to anyone on this, this presentation by any means that there's, there's this growing gap. And I, I'm a firm believer, I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire organization, but personally, I'm a firm believer that that gap is driving much of the issues that we're seeing, uh, societal issues, environmental issues, so I love the idea that we can try to get people reintroduced and really redevelop, not just an, a, an appreciation, which is critical, but an actual love uh, and respect for nature. And we've seen it. We've gotten a chance. You know, this picture is me with actually my godson and, and a good friend of mine's uh, two sons that uh, Christy and I care deeply about. So we've been pushing them quite a bit to get them out there. And these two uh, at the at, at one and a half and four years old, they lit up and they didn't want to leave. So I think it just proves that if we can get kids into nature and we can really give them something to be fascinated about, in this case, cavernous lime rock, as soon as they found that there were, uh, you know, that there were things inside of this lime rock, uh, old shells that were tens of thousands of years old, uh, all they thought about was dinosaurs. So we found that great connection. It's, a, it's an important piece of what we're doing. And I don't, I don't know, in my opinion, that there's many places in Collier County that have this much of a focus on, you know, for us, what's gonna be more of tactile learning opportunities. Obviously, the Conservancy does a great job of creating that environment, Corkscrew. There are a lot of organizations out there, but in the East Naples neighborhoods, we felt like it was a, it was a very important piece of what we were doing to introduce that to these communities. This was also a big piece of Dr. Gore's mission in life, frankly. Um, Dr. Gore had, a, had an interesting backstory, which we've learned more and more over the years, uh, getting closer with his family and speaking with his children. And, and obviously Linda, who's on the call that has, has had a, you know, a long background with Dr. Gore, known him for, for a long time up until his, his passing. Dr. Gore was a, a conservationist born out of frustration. I think is probably the best way to describe him. Grew up on the East Coast, went away to college, came back to find this, this wild old Florida land behind his home completely demolished for development. And that seems to have triggered an undying and, and sometimes pretty ferocious uh, conservation mindset. And he was very outspoken, thankfully. He originally purchased the 10 acres 
that we currently are renovating and restoring and built this dream Florida cracker style home, which is incredible in and of itself on that property. As time went on, he started to recognize just how much magic was around him. And he slowly and uh, strategically built up and amassed a 265 acre area. I think at one time we've read some of the old literature, there were he identified eight different ecosystems on that 265 acres of land that he had uh, he had purchased over time. One big thing that Dr. Gore did was he actually got this, um, you know, officially certified as a Florida nature sanctuary and brought children out here and educated children and tried to get children reconnected with nature that he appreciated as a child that gave him that respect and appreciation for how critical it was to be a good steward. So we do feel that we are very focused on continuing that part of his legacy. I don't know that we'll be making wine out of the, out of the beauty barrier, out of the, out of the fox grape or any of that, but absolutely we're looking to connect not just the children, frankly, but the whole community back to what old Florida was and in an effort to try to build that appreciation back up, because we're seeing a lot of growth and a lot of development. And I think it's, it's very important to make sure that people do find a reason and a passion to protect it, like many of us do. We are looking to obviously get this whole program with this whole property opened up to the community. We have definitely run into some, some challenges, uh, COVID being not the least of which we've, uh, we've been challenged with, but it's also presented some opportunity because today, as I'll share with you here in, in upcoming slides, we have been able to really restore this property to its glory, uh, potentially even beyond. I'm sure there's some things that Dr. Gore would not be entirely happy with. Uh, like decks and boardwalks, but I think when he sees the children in the community out here really appreciating and, and enjoying this property, he would be very happy with what we've done with it. One of the big pieces of this restoration, frankly, was what, what is now the Gore Nature Education Center. Uh, this was Dr. Gore's personal home. We have converted and are in the final stages of converting this into purely an education center. We have a full classroom set up. All of the microscopes and supplies and all the fun stuff is just kind of coming in now. And we're going to be starting to get the classroom outfitted in the next couple of weeks. But it's, it's quite a unique property in that he did truly build this stilted Florida Cracker style home in the middle of this hardwood hammock and did very little damage or made very few changes in the midst of doing that. So he did a phenomenal job of maintaining the character of the property. We have continued to try to follow that behavior and, and do disturb as little as possible, but obviously have found the balance of making sure that we truly do create a place that the community can enjoy. We've improved the infrastructure of the property. Uh, we've got ample parking, working on an outdoor bathroom facility, so it is fully ADA compliant, uh, but there's just so much here to, to take in and enjoy. It's something that we're really, you know, really working hard towards. And finally, in the, in the stages of getting it open to the community. At this point, as far as getting open, we expect in the next 30 days, uh, many of you may be getting messages. We're gonna be opening specifically for private tours until COVID is maybe a little bit more under control uh, vaccinations are more widespread, everybody's a little bit more comfortable. But what we're excited about is this is going to give us an opportunity to give you a very in-depth docent-led tour. And when I say docent-led, we have quite a group here at the board uh, full of knowledge on the flora and fauna, the architectural style of the home and the reasons that it's set up the way it is, and obviously the background of the property and, and future plans of the property. So after this, we'll, we'll take some, some questions, obviously, and provide a little bit more depth on that, but we'll also make sure everybody has a link if you would like to reach out and schedule one of those private tours. And in this picture, we also will share a little bit more, but this is one of our 
Christy and I, and, and many of us, uh, our favorite parts of the property is the barred owls have really taken a liking to the area where we put the boardwalk and the deck. It makes for very easy hunting, I think is why they're so, so much enjoying it so much. So again, as we look at restoring the property, it's really two parts. The center is just about complete. The accessibility and the functionality of the center is, is coming together very nicely. We are also very focused on two parts of the property in general. Uh, first and foremost is invasive removal. The Brazilian pepper on this property is prolific. I probably am a bit, uh, maybe not the best person to say that because I've only been here three years, but We've had a number of contractors on the property looking at it and have said that it's some of the largest and most well-established pepper head they've ever seen, Brazilian pepper. So we've got about seven acres and thanks to the, the relationships and collaboration with, with Andy uh, and Wade, we are moving closer and closer towards getting into full active invasive removal. We've worked with, we've got FGCU students, uh, Florida Southwest, students that we've worked with that are, are helping us bit by bit on the invasive removal. But as you can imagine, 10 acres having been primarily unmanaged by someone with Dr. Gore's knowledge for going on 20 years at this point is, uh, it's got a lot of work. We got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, but we're also finding some really incredible stuff on the property. One of the things in the picture here, the Florida peperomia, this is a, an endangered plant. Uh, Linda, with Linda's help, we have identified this. There are actually two different uh, versions of this plant, I believe, on the property. So we are, you know, identifying slowly but surely not just some of the native plants on the property, but some of the, the rare native plants on the property. And we've been able to tap into a great group of advisors that are working with us and helping us on the board uh, to as to kind of increase our awareness and our knowledge of this. And obviously, uh, Andy has been an incredible resource as, as has Wade and, and everybody else at the Native Plant Society, amongst others. So when we really talk about the big picture mission for us at Cypress Cove Land Keepers, it's really about conserving this habitat for threatened and endangered species, both flora and fauna, and utilizing these spaces for environmental education and nature-inspired experiences. We have a tremendous amount of wildlife on the property, being that we are located, I always refer to it as Kitty Corner, to the Florida National Panther Refuge and the Picayune State Forest. We, we see a lot of panther uh, kittens, moms. We had a really cool year last year with a mother and three kittens on the property, and we literally got to watch them grow up on our trail cameras, which was a pretty awesome experience for all of us. Every week, we were excited to pull up the new footage and see what was happening, what they were doing, what they were up to. We'll share a little bit of that footage with you here shortly. But there's also, like I said, that, that second piece of this is there are so many of us down here that are committed to this stewardship mentality and to trying to preserve and keep as much of this land as possible from getting developed or getting cut off. Obviously, wildlife corridors are, are a big issue to help these panthers get north. We really need to and are focused on driving that mindset into the community. I have actually been shocked at how few people in the community are aware of what's around them. There is a deep-seated fear, frankly, uh, for some of the wildlife. And we really get excited about the opportunity to get people out there and re-educate them, or uh, at least take away the miseducation at the very least. So this is a big part of our focus, but beyond where we are today, the Gore Nature Education Center was, is, I should say, the flagship project for us. This is ultimately the, the genesis of this organization was to try to purchase and, and get Conservation Collier to purchase the lands around us for this purpose. But this is just the start for us. We are working towards our open. It's going to be exciting. 
the book, which I'm going to introduce you to here in a moment uh, and, and tell you a little bit about, is, is really focused on getting this project off the ground, getting the community out there, getting people connected. But beyond this, we see a huge need in Collier County, Southwest Florida in general, for a group that's truly focused on the preservation of these types of habitats, of these lands. There's a fair amount of green space out there that is just looking like a gold mine to developers. I work in the construction world. So it's, you know, sometimes people say, isn't, isn't that a little bit ironic that you're in that space? But, but I work with a very different kind of company. We, we believe in sustainable building, number one. But number two, we also respect what attracts people to the communities that we may work in. And I can speak for myself, and I'm sure many of you on this call, whether you were born and raised here, or this is a place that you found, discovered, and fell in love with, like my wife and I, or you're still a snowbird. You come down here for a reason. This is a beautiful place. It's not just in a group of important ecosystems for Florida or for Southwest Florida. This is an internationally important set of ecosystems and, and place in the world. So we, we really are trying to push for easements, for the purchasing and the donation of as much green space in Southwest Florida as possible. And I recognize through experience that that takes a tremendous amount of work, which is why we are so focused on building a board and a group of advisors around us and really setting the right foundation in place with this organization to continue to go throughout Southwest Florida and find opportunities to buy lands like this truly put good management plans in place to preserve them in the way or restore them back to the way they should be to try to sustain as much of the, the wildlife and the flora and fauna and all the exciting things that all of us enjoy uh, because if somebody doesn't step in and start doing this soon this is not going to be around for future generations which would be a shame so that is really our long-term focus beyond the gore nature education center we are thankful that Conservation Collier came to their senses and got back into purchasing land at a perfect time when the founder of this organization was pushing for this. Uh, she frankly pulled off a bit of a miracle in the eyes of most people in getting them to purchase 170 acres around us. So we have gotten quite lucky in the fact that we only have to manage and maintain 10 of those. The hope going forward is that we continue to find opportunities to collaborate with Conservation Collier as a taxpayer funded program, anything we can do to support them and they can do to support us in educating the community on these lands is exciting uh, to any of us. So speaking of, this is, this is no small feat. It truly does take a community. It takes a small army at times. Uh, so this is all our small army of conservationists. And from left to right, we have Vera J who is actually the newest member of our board, got introduced to Vera last year, uh, incredible woman, interior designer, a uh, very unusual interior designer here in Naples who Christy and I have grown very close and, and friendly with. Vera is an incredible asset. She actually has a, a long background in the San Francisco Bay Area of being a docent. Um, so she, she will be the friendly face that will share a lot about the architectural style of the home and a lot of the design functionality and, and why it's so unique and was so popular in, in, in old Florida and where the whole cracker style of architecture even was born from. Um, that's me in the second from the left. And then Jennifer Reed, our vice president. <clears throat> Jennifer has been an incredibly invaluable uh, reason for me to be here today. Jennifer has supported me in taking on this role and taking on this massive project. Jennifer actually founded and ran a nonprofit up in the Connecticut area for Lyme disease. So a significant background in nonprofit and PR and communications work. So Jennifer is definitely a name that you'll see in here quite a bit. If you do come out and check out the center, you'll likely meet her. Um, Neil and down there is actually the founder, Bobby Lee Davenport. Bobby Lee has uh, been a conservationist and you know, advocate for environmental causes here in Southwest Florida for a long time. She found out about Dr. Gore's property and, and what was going on and really 
passionately pursued Conservation Collier to purchase this property. So she really is the first person that got this project started, thankfully. Behind Bobby Lee is Kathy Reno. Uh, Kathy has also been a, a huge proponent and supporter of this project, heard about it through Bobby Lee. And Kathy has a very deep background in organizational management. Uh, she has gotten much more involved uh, just since December of this past year, really leads the charge on all of our grant writing, a lot of the stuff that we're doing right now to fund the children's programs, educational programs, et cetera. So Kathy, again, is, is someone I think will be a big part of this organization long-term. Susan Flowers, just next to her. Susan is an absolute ball of joy. Uh, Susan is actually the, the reason that I got involved with this and my wife got involved with this. She does a lot with our volunteers, community outreach, and it's just a joy to be around and gets people excited and, and has brought a lot of us to this group. So she's a, a key piece of the foundation of this. And then Arlene Clough, all the way to the far right. Arlene is actually also from the New York, upstate New York area. Well, actually, I shouldn't say upstate. She's Western New York, but like Christy and I, she is a New Englander originally. Arlene has done a lot with the Menden Land Trust up in New York. So she's really brought a fair amount of experience and knowledge on the land trust side to us. She is also an avid gardener and has, has played a key role in the beginning of beginnings of what our, our future pollinator garden that will be installed here this beginning of the summer will look like. So that's the board. That is the team that makes all this possible. When we start to look at the property, uh, there's a lot of unique pieces of this property that I think really what has pulled me into it and probably majority of those of us that are involved. And it's always interesting to bring, especially those that have grown up in this part of Florida onto the property and hear that they tell us they've never seen anything quite like it. So we are down to just the 10 acres of our trail system. You'll see in the orange kind of area over here, this is actually the first run of Conservation Collier's Trails, which was just expanded. Oh, click too soon there, which was actually just expanded as well. And this is our 10 acres in the middle, our trail system, which is fairly extensive, not nearly as much pine upland as you'll find on the county's property, but we've got a small amount of pine upland. The majority of this is hardwood hammock. We have some, some pretty unique areas on the property, not the least of which you see back here is Laurelin. Um, but one of the cool things, and I think what really sucked me into this property was the cavernous lime rock, which I had never experienced anything quite like it until we, we toured the property. This is not a boardwalk trail system. This is not a flat pine upland smooth trail system. Uh, not to discourage anybody from coming out, but what you are going to see here is truly old Florida, north end of the Everglades, cavernous lime rock, as you can see in this image here, all of these old fossilized shells. Uh, it's just, it's a really cool place. And lime rock, as, as I've learned, is actually not something that you see have this cavernous uh, trait to it. Uh, but I think a big part of what's driven this is this is old seabed. So there was a lot of salt water, which has formed different types of cavities in this that you don't normally see um, in lime rock. Uh, it's normally in, in other types of rock. So very interesting property. When you come out, check out the trail system. This is a little bit more of an adventurous trail back here, but this is also a big reason that Dr. Gore decided to purchase this as his first piece of property for preservation. Uh, in the far back there, what we refer to as Laurelin, Dr. Gore named, is an ephemeral pond. So this is probably about a foot to two foot at its deepest point during the wet season. Right now it is pretty well dried down, but it's a, it's a really unique piece of the property, ton of wildlife back there. It is in the wet season, the primary reason that the panther will walk around. We don't get as many of them on the cameras during the wet season, but now that it's dried down, we're starting to see a lot more activity and they're back to using the trails as much as many of us are. 
So we're going to be expanding these trails. There were a lot of trail systems that were filled in by Wilma and, uh, and Irma over the years. So we are we're kind of slowly bringing those back to life. And I would say probably when all said and done, we'll have somewhere around two miles of trail systems. The county will have probably closer to three or four. And one of the exciting parts of this loose partnership at the moment will be a lot deeper partnership in the coming years with conservation colliers, the trail systems will connect. So you'll be able to traverse three or four different ecosystems inside of, you know, an hour, depending on how fast you walk. So very unique property. And a, a huge thank you to the team at Rookery Bay and Florida Southwest actually for helping us develop and run GPS on these trail systems. So for some of you that were on the call at the beginning, the, the social hour, we, we talked a bit about you know how small the world is uh, here in Southwest Florida. If, if this is something that's part of your life, whether it be conservation, native plants, animals, we are really focused today on trying to cultivate as many relationships as possible in this, in this group of individuals because, you know, like I said, it really does take a community. And we want as many organizations that have shared values and visions to ours to be able to come out here and leverage and educate and share this property with their members, with their families. And, you know, the work that the, the collaborative work that we've been able to do with Andy and Wade and the entire group and the whole, the whole board at the Naples chapter of Florida Native Plant Society has been a big part of that. We are also, you know, working with Connor, I'm sorry, Connor County Schools. They're going to be starting field trips out there this fall from a number of the, the, the schools, not just in the Golden Gate Estates area, but throughout Collier County. We have active collaborative partnerships with FWC with their biology team because of the amount of panther traffic we have through there, working with um, federal fish and wildlife as well, panther refuge. So we are, we are firm believers in collaboration, uh, to say the least. And we're excited about how those relationships are going to come together and how many people are going to be able to learn and leverage this property. Pollinator Garden is the next big project for us. We were with, uh, with the help of Andy and team, we were able to land a grant actually from the um, Naples Garden Club. And uh, we're going after a few others as well, but currently we are getting ready, uh, getting the final plans in place to plant come June, July, a very large pollinator garden. And this is actually uh, some of the FGCU students working on it with, um, with our board member Arlene Clough kind of overseeing. And not only do we have this large pollinator garden, which will have both nectar and, and host plants very well laid out, but we've also got some natural pollinator garden areas on the property, some of which Dr. Gore had originally curated, some of which are just completely organic. So we think we'll have a, a fair amount of areas on the property that pollinators will continue to enjoy. We see a ton of butterfly now. We get, uh, we get a fair amount of activity as it is. So we're excited to see what the continued development will look like here. And it's, uh, it's a big thing that drives a number of people involved. So the, obviously there's incredible opportunity as it relates to, as we say, becoming a land keeper. Uh, we have a link here and Andy will also share that at the end of the call and we'll, we'll make sure to follow up with any emails necessary. There should be a built-in link here if you want to look at volunteer opportunities. In the coming months, we have most of the updates to the property getting done, but we will definitely need as many hands as possible. I'm sure there's not going to be a whole bunch of people who are going to jump on this opportunity, but we have a ton of invasive removal that's required on the property. There's also great opportunities to work with us in the gardens and the planting, which probably is a lot more fun than pulling pepper and pulling Caesar wheat. But there's so many opportunities, everything from, from the invasive removal to the plantings to, we're also very interested in people who may be excited about the idea of touring people around the property. Obviously the group here has a passion and an expertise for native plants, which is a big piece of the educational 
component to the tours that we're going to be giving. So today we've had hundreds of volunteers, like I said, FGCU, Florida Southwestern, many people from the community that are just hearing what we're doing and, and jumping in. Uh, you can see here, Linda, who's on the call today, we continue to leverage her expertise to guide a lot of these students and a lot of volunteers. Uh, but as we kind of move forward, anyone who has that expertise, naturalists, Florida Master Naturalists especially, we would love anybody's involvement to come out and help to educate the community. So we'll talk about the part that got me most involved, and this is hopefully showing okay for everyone. This is the mother and two of the three kittens from last year. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time really looking through the locations, the game trails, and strategically placed. Today we have nine uh, trail cameras on the property. We also have some high definition camera traps, as they're called, DSLR traps that are designed to catch very high resolution, beautiful images of some of the wildlife, which is what you'll see here. Uh, obviously, black bear. We, we caught a black bear on the cameras a week and a half ago. Uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Jason Staten, Jay Staten, I should say, so I'll call him Jason. Uh, he runs a nonprofit called Panther Cans, and Jay has some incredible photography that his cameras have caught. These are locations on our property that he has his cameras set up. As you can see, we we get probably more excited with Jay's photos than we do our, our trail cameras because the resolution is just incredible. But here we've got you know, Florida black bear, the, the camera that he caught a couple weeks ago, he said was the largest black bear he's ever caught on camera. And it was a very large bear, it didn't even fit in the frame of this camera. So you can imagine. Uh, Bobcat, love the property. And this is one of the interesting ones for us. We caught our first glimpse of a spotted skunk on the property. I think it was, it was two years ago at this point. For anyone here who's been fortunate enough to catch a glimpse of one, they move very quickly. They are quite shy. Uh, and FWC is actually in partnership, I think, with another company or another organization right now is doing a study. So Andy, I don't know if you are able to do the poll, but I thought it would be very interesting because we did not realize how rare these, these little guys were. And uh, so we, we figured we'd just take a little poll. Have you ever seen an Eastern spotted skunk here in Collier County? We figured, you know, we'll make use of everybody being on this call and maybe we can share this information with FWC and provide a little bit of values. So they're trying to really determine what does the population look like here in Collier County? They're actually running this study all through Florida. But we see these, these skunks quite often. I say, I say, unfortunately, it's not really unfortunately, but we also have uh, a couple gray fox on the property that we are pretty sure are trying to track down these skunks. But so far, so good. They are quite cunning, obviously good hiders. They love this cavernous lime rock area because it gives them lots of shelter from predators. So this, this one here has been on the cameras on pretty much two to three times a week basis. So it'll be interesting to see what the poll results are there. On the boardwalk, this is actually just from a couple days ago. We get quite a few barred owls. Uh, we, this one uh, gave, gave me a fair warning that I was messing up his hunting. So right after that, he buzzed right over the top of my head. But the barred owls love it out there. You'll hear them calling quite a bit. Red shoulder hawks, tons and tons of red shoulder hawks. Again, we have some pretty open space with some of the recent pepper removal that we've done has created uh, a prime hunting environment for the hawks. These are some of the other residents. These are those crafty gray fox I mentioned. One of the cool things when we got these photos, I've seen a lot of gray fox in my time, but never seen a flash photo of one quite like this where the red just absolutely pops. These two we believe are denning on the property. We've caught them quite a bit together at night hunting, uh, hunting these, these awesome little mice. Uh, this is one of the kits that Christy mentioned early on the call. They had been 
pretty much regulars. This one was quite curious as to what that big flashy light was on the tree. One of the interesting things that I found with these camera traps is I was concerned that they would actually spook the wildlife. The fox are incredibly curious, does not bother them one bit. This is the only panther that we have ever had that has actually looked at one. And we've got quite a few photos, but we believe that this was one of those kittens that we captured last year and uh, have recently seen a fair amount back on the cameras. Now that the dry season is, is back upon us. We've got some incredible footage. Check out our Instagram and Facebook pages. We try to keep them updated. We do a trail cam Tuesday as, as regularly as possible. And always like to share this week's or you know, the most recent wildlife footage that we are getting. Shane, would you like me to share the poll results? Yes, that would be awesome if you got them. Okay, there we go. So five people have seen the Eastern Spotted Skunk and 12 people have not. So well, there you go. Absolutely. That, that obviously is why the, the study is, has been such a hot topic of recent. 71% of you have never seen them. It's all the more reason you got to get out to the center. Check out what we're doing out there. Thanks, Andy. I will share that with FWC. I'm sure they will not be surprised, but it's useful information for them all, all the same. So as we, we kind of just wrap up here and we'll, we'll share a little bit more of obviously some of the native plants that we're seeing out there, the thistle. And this was a pretty cool shot that we got, uh, I believe, and I could be mistaken, my wife will correct me, but I believe that these are the orchid bees and uh, a couple of them likely mating. That was a, a pretty awesome opportunity she had to get that shot. Uh, so those are, are bees also that have, we see quite a few of with all of the, especially the firebush. They absolutely love the firebush. And that bald cypress image that you saw at the beginning. And speaking of firebush, uh, we, uh, we, this, this has been an interesting plan for us. For any of you that don't know, I'm sure most of you do. The, the firebush is, is a really interesting plant in that obviously the pollinators love it. Uh, we'll probably be all a little bit jealous of the bees. They get to engulf themselves in flowers like, like this one, like the firebush just all day long. But the firebush has proven incredibly helpful for us and actually for a lot of volunteers. Uh, if you don't know, it does an incredible job of relieving fire ant and mosquito bites. Um, so just a helpful little hint. If you spend a lot of time outside, it was a year and a half before anybody brought this up to us. Uh, we wished somebody had told us sooner because it does have, it does have a, a, an incredible ability to do this. In fact, the one of the, the boys that you saw in that image early on, my godson, his brother, marveling at the lime rock were marveling a little bit too much. And one of them stood right on top of a fire ant's nest. He is not a kid that enjoys pain or has much of a tolerance for it. So he started panicking and we put the fire bush on his hand and it was almost instantaneous. Uh, he just forgot all about it and moved on with his day. So awesome tool. If you spend a lot of time outside, I find the fire bush to just be super useful. Uh, I probably use it more than I should. Bug spray would help. I don't enjoy bug spray. So it does the job. So that is it. We hope to see a lot of you out on the trails when we get open. And like I said, we are ready for private tours, I would say within the next week. So definitely check us out on the website. And I will leave you with a slide here in a moment that has all of our contact information, location, some links to Google Maps. And like I said, we, we stay pretty up to date on, on the social media streams on Facebook and Instagram. And if you go to our website, you can actually sign up to get on the email list. And as we have any special events, trips, presentations at the property, uh, which will probably be starting here this summer, any of you that are here during the summer, welcome to come check it out. Excited to get you out there. And for those of you that are heading north for the summer, look forward to getting you out there when you come back next year. So that's it for me. Any questions or anything? I'd be happy to, to answer any. Thanks so much, Shane.
Wonderful presentation, lots of exciting potential and possibilities to look forward to. And um, you're welcome to turn on your camera if you want to for the Q&A portion. I know for me, it's really exciting. Um, well, first of all, thank you to Evan Barr for putting all of those links into the chat. Uh, so from learning more about the Eastern Spotted Skunk to uh, the volunteer opportunities with Cypress Cove Landkeepers and other uh, contact information for them. Thank you for sharing those, Evan. And also, if anybody has any questions, please take this time to type them into the chat and then I'll be able to ask them to, to Shane as we go along. So Shane, I know for me, it's really exciting that there is going to be this new conservation education property and organization that is in Eastern Collier County. Um, as we know that new communities and neighborhoods are being constructed further and further east into the county. It's great that there are these resources where um, anybody can go learn about the natural areas there and their importance to our community. Um, one thing that I've been wondering, just to give people a little more time to put in some questions, um, I've had some experience doing wet walks in some preserves and I know that part of your property has the ephemeral pond and you have cypress trees, which can you know, stand in the standing water for a good portion of the year. So I'm wondering if, if you've done any wet walks out there or if maybe there's thoughts of doing those in the future. That's a great question. We have not. Uh, Linda has probably been the only one that has done any wet walks on this property historically. The, the pond area in the back, we, our property line ends basically about 10 foot, well, depending on how wet in the wet season we are, maybe 20 to 30 foot into the pond. So we are working with the county to develop, you know, our, our official shared trail system. And I think that's something that definitely Molly Duvall, the, the Collier County Conservation Collier, but Collier County Land Manager that's in charge of the Dr. Robert H. Cord III Preserve, which is Conservation Collier's land there. Uh, she's pretty excited about the opportunity to do some of these hosted walks. So I think we'll definitely take advantage of that. It's, it's a property that obviously there's a fair amount of wet area back there. So a couple people that actually Christy, I think, went, uh, went out and toured one of the members actually of Rookery Bay, and he did walk the entire circle of the pond, but we have not yet. I'm kind of excited to because a lot of activity back there and that's maybe a future field trip for, for this group. Very cool. We'll be looking forward to that. Let me take a look at the chat here. Uh, Lisa is wondering what part of the firebush plant takes away the sting of the fire ants? So basically the leaf, if you just take the leaf and muddle it up really good, uh, just basically the juices that are coming out of that leaf is, is all we have used. Um, I don't know what, Christy may be a good one to answer. I don't know what the properties are of the flower, if she's looked into that at all. But yeah, just the leaf is, is incredibly relieving. Just crush it up good and wipe it all over that area. That's fascinating about firebush. I didn't know it had that, that property, but that is very good information to have. I knew about the American beauty berry, that the, uh, the fragrance of the leaves when they're crushed up can be deterring to mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Quick note on that. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> we experimented with that and Christy has a background in, in skincare. So she actually created a, we tested with the beauty berry for an insect repellent. And what we found ironically was that it 
definitely works incredibly well to repel mosquitoes, but we are trying to figure out how to offset the other side and that it actually attracts wasps. Uh, so after 10 minutes of being harassed by a wasp and chased and coming home and finding out that Christy had tested it the same day at Corkscrew and had the identical experience, we're pretty sure that it's a, it's a plausible thought that that's actually what caused it. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it does do an incredible job though, but I, we may have gone a little extreme. So don't want to deter anybody from trying it, but keep your eyes out. If you start getting harassed by wasps, it's probably <laughs> necessary. One other one too, Andy, that I'll share is the, the dog fennel, which is you know pretty popular around here. That also works quite well on both sides. I've not tested it personally as a deterrent, but it also works very well with stings and bites and mosquito bites included. That's, that's one, I guess that's a little bit more well-known. So if you can't find fire, fire bush, look for that dog fennel. It's always good to know the plants that we have around us that can help us in our time of need. Is there anybody um, in the meeting who maybe doesn't have access to the chat feature, but you would like to unmute yourself to ask a question? We have some compliments in the chat for you, Shane. Thank Mary Ann is thanking you for all your hard work and appreciating all that you're doing and that you gave a great presentation and I concur. And Beth is saying great meeting and presentation, had fun with the native plant quiz. So thank you again, Shane, for providing those excellent photos for the native plant ID game earlier tonight. And Marie also enjoyed the presentation. She's looking forward to visiting. That's success as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate all the, uh, all the, all the interest. And like I said, links in, in there and we'll make sure that everybody gets them after this. And by all means, we're, we're out there quite often. So we'll look forward to getting everyone out there soon. Thank you. We have one more compliment from Jay. Beautiful presentation full of information and inspiration. That's a great one. Thanks, Jay. All right. So if there aren't any more questions at this time, we're still getting more thank yous and everybody learned a lot from tonight. Um, I wanted to open it up to um, Karen Allman, if you're on the call right now. Um, I mentioned our field trip that's coming up this Saturday, but there is another outdoor event coming up this Saturday. So Karen, if you'd like to talk about Gopher Tortoise Day on Marco Island. Sure. Um... So at Mackle Park and Marco Island, and um, if you haven't seen on social media or just around, um, it is Gopher Tortoise Day this Saturday. So um, the city of Marco and the Western Everglades, um, no, Audubon chapter have kind of gotten together and they're having a little festival down at Malcolm Park for the gopher tortoises. And I'm gonna have a table down there to promote native plants that gopher tortoises eat that you can have in your own property. Cause there's quite a few lots that are um, undeveloped and developed on Marco Island that have gopher tortoises on it. So what they're trying to do is help promote the preservation of the tortoise. And one of the ways to help get tortoises happy is to maintain plants that will be um, good for them to eat. So it's going to be really great. Um, the uh, cutting horse provided some plants for me to take with me down there to show people in person how we have a variety of native plants that they can um, grow on their yard. And I, I honestly, I feel bad because I'm not even sure what else is going on at the festival. But um, if you guys are interested, I certainly welcome 
to see you down there and say hello. And if pot, you might even get lucky and get a plant. So um, just keep that in mind for this Saturday as well. Thank you, Karen. All right, well, if there are no further questions, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Thank you again, Shane, for a wonderful presentation and everyone else from Cypress Cove Landkeepers who joined us this evening. It's been great having you with us. I think we're all looking forward to visiting the new nature center and preserve sooner or later. And uh, everybody have a wonderful evening and remember to join us next month. It'll be Wednesday, May 5th, six o'clock for the social time or 6.30 for the official beginning of the meeting and the feature presentation from Eric Fote on native plants and eco philosophy. Thanks everybody, have a great evening. Thanks Andy.